Hey, everyone. Today's guest and co-host is the wonderful Karen Pittman, who you might know from her work on The Morning Show and Just Like That, Yellowstone and The Americans. Karen and I talk about her upcoming project, Unthinkably Good Things, growing up as the weird one in her family, falling in love with someone's potential, being loyal to oneself, learning from difficult times, and a lot more. Our first call today is with Martha, who recently broke up with her boyfriend of 12 years, but due to their financial situation, still lives with him. After repeatedly arguing about what went wrong, Martha wonders if it will be possible to even remain friends. Next to call in is Jasmine, a 32-year-old mother of two who has been in a serious relationship with a man who seems to really love her and her kids. Multiple conversations about weddings and proposals led Jasmine to assume they would get married, only to then discover that her boyfriend doesn't believe in marriage. Now Jasmine feels like she has been deceived and wonders if she should end the relationship. As always, thank you for being here and supporting Unqualified. If you have a question and would like to talk with us, we would love to hear from you. Just look for the link at unqualified.com. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Unqualified with your host, Anna Ferris. Hi, Karen. I want to talk about your new project. It's called Unthinkably Good Things. Will you tell us about it? Unthinkably Good Things is written by Cass Seegers, and she wrote this story, and the director of development, Tony Judson, brought it to Mahogany Hallmark, the network, when she started working there with Wanya Lucas, and Wanya is the new CEO of Hallmark, an African-American woman, and Tony is an African-American woman, and it was Wanya's idea that they have this 30, 40-year-old brand at Hallmark where they have extended all of these cards and all of this product into the African-American community for decades around family and relationships and love. And she said, why not expand that at the television level and start to create a brand around that for original television programming? So Tony went out to make that story work And they created this story about a woman who is working in Italy and loving life, Uh single mother. And while there, she taps into her creative spark. Her friends, who she hasn't seen in a couple of years, decide to come visit her in Italy at the very end of this teaching project she's been doing there. And they obviously are enamored of her life there and are trying to help her figure out how to live her best life as friends will try to help you do. And adventure ensues. Do your friends in Unbelievably Good Things get jealous of your character? Is there tension there? You know, it's sort of an interesting thing as you have in personalities with your girlfriends. I mean, you're really, really good girlfriends. You can talk about those things with them. Mm -hmm. But in this story, there's no like friction or jealousy. It really is a true expression of that female friendship, love dynamic that you can experience with women who are just really there for you. They want your 100% best. And sometimes our ideas of who we are get in the way of what we actually need to do in life, how we identify. Uh And I think that's definitely true for African-American women. We think of ourselves as, you know, magical beings, you know, the Black girl magic. Do you know what I mean? And in a lot of ways, that means that we have to withstand supernatural, incredible levels of challenging moments in our lives and fight through them. And sometimes it just means that you surrender and you're vulnerable and you reach out and you ask for love and people are there to give it to you. And so yeah, those are the characters that I really love to do. Women who look like they have it all figured out, but inside they're just you know, soft, you know, humans trying to figure this world out because I feel like that a lot in my own life. Yes, completely. You know, as an actor, we have to go where the work is. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I find myself living this nomadic life and I've had to have a conversation with myself very clearly, but especially in the last two or three years 
about what loneliness is, how to conjugate loneliness in my life, how it's defined. And then I've had to have a conversation with myself about where is your home? What is home, right? Yeah, that's one of the questions I frequently ask guests. Like I was just talking to my sister earlier today. I was like, I think I was adopted. What was the impetus? I love this. Because I was just like, you guys are weird and I'm not. And I don't belong to you. But for so many years in my family, the politics of it was Karen's the weird one. And I was like, no, I'm actually the one that makes the most sense here in this film. (laughs) In what way were you perceived as the outsider? I mean, I was an artist. I was dramatic. And you have four siblings. Yeah. So did they pick on you or? I think the reflection of it, my family was, oh, we really love you. We love you. But the thing right above love for me was, but you have to be loyal to family. You have to be loyal to us. And that took precedence over acceptance and what my definition of love was when I was growing up. If you act a certain way, then we'll love you. Do you know? If you are a certain thing, then we'll love you. But you have to be loyal. It's just in the last decade that I've sort of unraveled that to understand that love doesn't really have a ton of condition on it. First and foremost, I'm loyal to myself. And so now my sister and I can kind of laugh about it. So the conversation earlier today was, you know what? I I think I might have been adopted (laughs) in this family because you guys are so strange. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, I was always the odd egg in my family. Did you feel that way in high school? By the time I got to high school, I had defined it as a benefit. Good. I had defined it as the thing that made me different was the thing that made me exceptional. That's early recognition. It was very early. And for a long time, I never experienced race, Blackness as a negative. I always thought it is part of what makes me exceptional in the world. I just made the assumption, like, I've got this thing, because I went to an all-white girl school, all Catholic, you know, in Nashville, and I just never felt the oppression of, I mean, I certainly felt like, oh, this is weird, you know, why does this skin thing, color thing matter? But my mind didn't process it like it was a negative thing, because I never hit a ceiling, right? I was always moving where I wanted to go. I didn't understand that there were doors that I couldn't open because a lot of the doors just opened up for me. So it wasn't until maybe a few years ago, I literally woke up one morning and I was like, oh, I could actually really get hurt. Like I could actually hit a ceiling because of this experience. And I started looking around my life and I was like, oh, that was a place where probably I got stopped and not physically, but stopped financially, stopped you know, Mm -hmm. in the things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I think that might have been because I was, I just never put it together. I was talking to my attorney, a guy named John Meigs Jr. John was like, yeah, it's so interesting that you just figured out a few years ago that you're Black. And I was like, right? (laughs) Because he was like, I figured that out 16 years old when someone pulled me over and took me out of the car I was driving because they thought it wasn't mine. So anyway, this idea of identity and how you define yourself, I think, is a human journey, right? Because you've Mm -hmm. been on it yourself. What's that been like for you? Ever shifting. I also grew up in a family that didn't believe in therapy. Oh, wow. It wasn't that they didn't believe in it. It's just that it was for other people. Mm Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's a good distinction to make. Yeah. People need it, just we don't. Mm -hmm. All that transcends this whole experience of time and age, race, gender. I think just we're all on this really extraordinary journey of what we call evolution. Yeah. And I do think you get to a certain level with your own understanding of the world and life and self. And you do realize, oh, this is a singular journey. Like everybody is on this journey on their own. You could link up arms with people for a little while on the Mm -hmm. journey. That's right. My son now is eight. How old is your son? You have a son, right? Yeah, he's nine. My son is 18. He graduated from high school a few weeks ago. Oh, man. He walks around here like it's kind of very man energy, but he also has this other energy of, are you going to make me breakfast? What's going on? (laughs) Like, But there was like a switch. Like, Something happened when he went to prom and then saw him walk across the stage. 
it's something happened where I'm like, oh, okay, you got to do your own thing now. Or yeah. I don't know. Like, I can't be the mom I was to you literally the minute before you walked across the stage. I have to prepare you in a different way for being an adult. But I do look at myself differently as a woman. I'm like, oh, shit, I have an adult child. That must mean I'm older. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even though in my mind, I'm like, I can't even believe anybody entrusted me with another human being, much less a child for 18 years. I'm 45. And I was thinking the other morning as I was drying my hair, at what age did I announce my age and it still felt young? Yes. And I was trying to think like when I was 28 and I said, I'm 28. At that time, was I thinking that's a little old? Probably. I felt like it was old. I really did. I remember turning 30. How sad. And I remember turning 30 and I was like, I've got to get it together. Like I have got to get it together. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And then I looked up a couple of years ago, clearly a long time from 30. And I was like, um, I've got to get it together. <laughs> Karen, will you tell us about a specific struggle in your life? and kind of how you dealt with it and how you worked through it? Specific struggle in my life. So many, you know, I'm reading this book called The Untethered Soul. Do you know this book? No. I'm doing this thing called 75 Hard. So 75 days, you do five things. You read 10 pages of a book, you drink a bunch of water, you exercise outside and you exercise inside and you take a picture of yourself every day for 75 days. And it's, it's kind of easy to, you know, but it's forced me to like sort of get in touch with the thing that keeps me from creating focus in my life. And one of the hardest things for me has been self-discipline. Yes. To discipline myself, to say no to myself. It's something that I've realized has always been very challenging. I am one of those people that as soon as I say, oh, I'm going to go on a diet, the next thought in my mind is, oh, I'm going to do what I want to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Instant rebellion. <laughs> the thing is, if you don't succeed in a day, you have to start back up at day oh, one. Oh, God. All right. I could use a program like this. So anyway, I think I've started over like 10 times. So I think maybe I'm on day 15 at this point. But the guy who started this thing, it took him a year to do 75 days. I like that confession. Karen, will you tell us about early love? Early love. Well, the love of my life was my father. Oh. My father has passed away now. When he died, it was very difficult for me to feel safe in the world, feel protected in the world. How old were you when he passed? When he died, I was in my late 20s. It was very early to lose my father mm -hmm. in my life. Yes. And so... The loss of his advocacy from the very beginning, my father sort of understood me, you know, and it marked the end of my marriage that I realized I could not be responsible for taking care of my husband and my child and myself. My husband really needed a lot of caretaking and I realized that I wasn't going to be a successful wife. I wasn't the thing he needed. It was a double sort of loss. We're actually, you asked me about love and now I'm talking about grief, which tells you a lot of my experience of mm -hmm. love over the mm -hmm. last decade or two. It's mm -hmm. really been about trying to figure out how to manage creating love, being in love, and also the inevitable sense of loss or grief that comes when you open your heart. Because most of the things and most of the people that I've loved in my life have eventually had to go. That's just part of what life is like. But my father was definitely my greatest love. He taught me empathy with his extraordinary failings and flaws. And he taught me fragility as a woman. And he helped me figure out healing through experiencing a good bit of pain with him. And he's just sort of extraordinary man who I don't think anyone is ever really going to measure up to. He was the person that I loved the most in the world. And in a lot of ways, I've talked to my friends about this in his passing. He doesn't linger around me. I have absorbed him. I have his thoughts, his patterns of behavior, his humor. He's actually inside me now as only someone who <laughs> understands spirituality could sort of grasp. Yeah. Um, Karen, are you in a relationship? 
I'm like actually working on myself right now. So I'm terrified of falling in love. Terrified. This goes kind of back to your loneliness discussion you've been having with yourself. Yeah. How much you're enjoying it, how much you need it, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I also think I feel extraordinarily vulnerable in the conversation of self-love and self-esteem and self-respect. So I struggle with the idea of falling in love because I know I could crack that open even further. Yeah. So there is someone that I think is just an amazing man. Um, You do have a huge smile on your face. (laughs) (laughs) I think he's amazing. And uh, he probably knows I think he's amazing. But I do think relationships go the way they need to. And so many times in my life, I've sort of forced them into being something. So this particular gentleman, I am allowing just things to evolve in the way they need to. When was the last time you were in love? Deeply in love, probably 2019 with a guy who was probably the worst boyfriend I'd ever had. And I think I called him into my life in order to heal, to resolve some things that had not yet healed. And I look at him now like an extraordinary gift. I do the Buddhist thing. I am very into like, how did this incredibly difficult thing make it into my life? And it was to teach me, to evolve me, to get me closer to connection. You're in this relationship. It's heady. It's like passionate. It's awful. It makes you feel like shit. When did you say, hey, get the fuck out of my life, please? Took me a long time. I mean, I have extraordinary patience, but I also, my healer says, you know, Karen, you like a fixer upper. Yes, you see the potential. (laughs) (laughs) I fall in love with the potential of anything, Uh, honey. I'm like, oh, that house could be cute though. Yeah. Oh, let's see if we can remake that chair. (laughs) Like, no, 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 this this script will work. It's like, no, honey, some things just don't need you to do that. And I did that with this particular man. I gave him a year and a half to work through the issues that he had no intention Mm -hmm. of actually resolving. Did he tell you that he did though? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Oh, man. But, you know, I can't even claim that I wasn't aware that it was likely a lie. At some point, I realized he was incapable of resolving it. And, you know, and this was during the first season of The Morning Show. This guy I was dating was very much like Steve Carell's character, Mitch Kessler. And I started to ask myself, well, he can lie to you, but are you going to keep lying to yourself? And when I realized I could no longer lie to myself about what I already knew was true, that's when it was over. Oh, man. I mean, there were any number of things that I could put two and two together. And I was like, this is not the right person for me. This is not the right relationship. It's toying with my self-respect and my self-esteem. I'm feeling like I have to choose between him and myself. Right? It's amazing that it took you only a year and a half. You know, I'm one of those people that I call on my spirit guides every now and then. And I don't do that very often anymore. But I believe that this is a powerful tool to understanding where you are, especially if you are someone who walks in the dark of this world because you are the light. And in many ways, I am the light in every path that I journey on. And I often say to my spirit guides, okay, tell me where we are, what's going on. And when they flip the switch and they provide me with the truth, it's often very brutal. It's never kind. (laughs) I don't get a lot of grace from my spirit guides because I think my purpose in this world is very specific. So when I was enlightened with the truth about where I was in the relationship, I had no choice but to go in the opposite direction. And that's true for almost every, every role, every job, every place I go. If I ask for guidance, I get it. And then I'm obedient to that guidance. Does that make sense? Yeah. And oftentimes when we talk with our callers, I'll give them a hypothetical scenario and ask them how it makes them feel in their gut. Like, what's that gut reaction? Is that relief? Is that dread? It's akin to the idea of like, almost like physically hearing yourself. 
I agree. I mean, I don't think that we need other people to tell us what to do or where to go. I think the answer is in us. People usually know. For sure. And I think that that's if you allow yourself to slow down long enough or speed up long enough to hear your own wisdom reaching out to keep you going, then you often have the answer. And it isn't necessarily the thing you want to hear, but if you're obedient to it, you almost always are much happier. You're more at peace. You're more content. And I think what I found in my life over time is that peace is more important than stimulation. You know, that kind of thing where, oh, I just want to be out and doing and feeling and I don't want that as much anymore. What I really want is to be able to lean back. And when I do rest, it's actual rest. Do you know what I mean? Yes. That takes discipline, too. Oh, for sure. Hey, Martha. Hi. I'm here with Karen Pittman, who is just lovely. Will you tell us what's going on? Where do I begin? So... My ex and I broke up after almost 12 years together. Recently, right? Yeah, it was actually, yeah, like two months to the day yesterday. And then tomorrow was actually going to be our anniversary. So it's been like a whirlwind of feelings even now, because unfortunately, we still have to live together because, you know, logistically, our lease literally just renewed in May. Uh, I've been in this. I ended up marrying the dude I wanted to break up with over Elise. Oh, no. Yeah. No. <laughs> I will not. That's my really style. <laughs> <laughs> she double downs on it. She's like, I'm going to double down. <laughs> yeah. It turned out to be a lot more expensive than breaking Elise. <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. You're in the right place, okay. Martha. You are in the right, right place. I'm glad you understand. <laughs> So yeah, it's just been like a weird thing ever since. I feel like for me, it's been a long time coming, you know, like it's been even years, maybe feeling like maybe this isn't it. Um, And now I've been post breakup where we've still argued about the reasons of breaking up and it like makes no sense anymore to do that. But then we had like a good month of not even talking about it anymore and just getting along and doing our own thing. But then last night we had another argument and I guess it's just like, it's weird, obviously. (laughs) So, okay. When you say that you wanted to break up, why? I guess that's like part of my question. I almost would love to be able to figure it out. I know that's maybe a lot to ask of myself, but I feel like for the most part, falling out of love was what happened because I feel like I still love him as a person Sure, and I wish him the best and all, but. I guess for a long time, we really didn't have like the connection of like just that connection that you need to have with someone, even intimately. Like, I feel like we've been friends for a long time now. So he's confused as to why you guys broke up and he doesn't want to be broken up. Is that right? No, we mutually agreed on it, but somehow we still end up arguing about it. Like he literally just told me last night that he told someone that he broke up with me. And I was like, no, it was mutual. So I feel like this shouldn't matter to me anymore, but it does bother me that he thinks he had an upper hand. And I feel like that's how it's been our whole relationship. Mm -hmm. That's weirdly competitive. Right. I also think the proximity Mm -hmm. doesn't foster healing. Mm -hmm. And I think you don't want to be responsible for hurting this human being that you love. So the question is, how do I manage taking care of myself and continuing to keep this incredible human being who has to be around me that I still really care about, but probably the days of romantic love are behind us, but I still love him. I still care about him and have to figure out how to make this thing work. Yeah, There's no way to unravel him living with you at this point. Mm-hmm. Is there any way to be proactive in that realm, like financially on either end? I feel like I've been really trying to get out of this and he hasn't. Yeah. It's been a whole thing, you know, like he, like a workman's comp case. So he wasn't working since 2020. Oh. He was diagnosed with severe depression earlier this year. So it made me feel even worse. Yeah. 
about doing anything. So I, that's why I never brought it up. And when he brought it up once, like he did, you know, went to see a psychiatrist of like, Oh, I think it's my environment that's doing, you know, that I have depression. It made me feel like, okay, so I'm to blame for, even though I've been the caretaker all along. I've had that experience to where I had to leave in order to get some peace. More than just peace, it's just even hear your own mind thinking. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Does he pay half of the rent? How does that work? Yes, we basically split everything the whole time. Okay. So when there's a move, it'll be you. Yeah, yeah. And he probably won't be able to afford the entirety of the rent. Right. So that's, yeah, totally his problem. Like, it's hard to begin with financially for both of us. Because right now it's like, if you break a lease, you have to pay more than just. So I can't just leave yet. And I'm trying to, yeah, like at least have my half of like, whether, you know, if we're breaking the lease or somebody else is moving in, still have to figure all that out. But yeah, I guess it's just like, I feel like attached in more way of like loving this person. And I have days where I'm okay. And then I have the days where I think of like, I don't know, was this a mistake or am I right to feel like I felt like a caretaker and maybe that's why the other side of the love is gone. Like I love him as a person, but maybe not as a partner or not attracted to him in that way anymore. What's been the shift in the two months? Has it gotten better? Are you guys intimate with each other? Like, no. has there been a shift at all towards a roommate situation? To me, that feels like the only practical goal for right now in like a month from now yeah. that you guys treat each other much more like roommates. And in two months, you have a set of rules and you don't fight over like your breakup. You fight over yeah. like the garbage, you know, whatever, yeah, not being right. taken out. True. You know what I mean? Like normal roommates, you each yeah. are able to bring home dates. That is my goal for you. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, it was pretty much a roommate shift. But then last night was what changed it. Why? Like, I guess just because he decided to ask if my brother hates him and if, like, if I hate him. And it's just like, no. He's really needy right now. He's really scared of losing you. And he's proud and he's feeling really low. Yeah. He's in a place where you can't fix him. And you feel really guilty about that. But I also feel like, Martha, you haven't really emotionally let go. Is that right? I guess not. Yeah. So I think first, it feels like you need to tell yourself in whatever way, create whatever you need to do for you to close it, for you to create healing for yourself. Because I feel like part of the conversation that we're having is like it's over. But there's something about your energy, which makes me feel like actually it's not over for Martha. You might be right, Karen. You might be right. Maybe I'm just living my past. Right. <laughs> I just feel like somewhere in Martha, it sounds like she's still she's still processing whether or not it's over. And I think when you create the closure and the resolution for yourself, mm -hmm. then the logistics, the money, all of that is going to fall into place. Yeah. Like, I feel like I've started working on the financial part. Like, I have a full time now job. Because but I'm I was talking about you, though, part. Martha. I'm talking about your emotional connection. No, yeah. I feel like I was there right away. And then I kind of like yeah. started thinking too much about it. But I think it is because I'm still here. Like, it's hard to really detach when, like, my body still physically has to come here every day. What's 12 years? Yeah, exactly. And I guess I wish it was easier, but you're like, 12 years is a long time to just be like done. And that's your friend. Yeah. I feel like in your mind, when you're ready to switch it out, the switch gets flipped. Anna and I were just talking about it. When you start telling yourself the thing that makes sense to you, the truth, what really has happened and what's happening. It's going to be hard to be swayed by that conversation of, oh, I broke up with you. or It, it, it don't matter who broke up who, we, we're broken up. Right. This is what it is yeah. now. Or yeah. we're not broken up. We're actually love each other a lot and we're going to figure out how to work this through. Um, but it's going to be a while before we get there. So what does this world look like while we transition into a space where we can figure it out, right? How do we yeah. make that transition? I feel like it starts with you first. The transition mm -hmm. starts with you. Well, also, Martha, I keep going back to my first marriage. <laughs> <laughs> we never talked about kids. We never talked about the future. I didn't want to get married. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering where you guys are at, like, because I think you 
opened up this conversation by telling us that you've been thinking about breaking up for a long time. And, you know, I always think about like our big decisive moments, at least from my experience, start out as a little tiny seed in the back of your brain. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how long you guys have been in this limbo. If you guys talk about marriage, the future, or ahead in the past, at least. Yeah, we did. We like talked about it. That's why we decided to move in together in the first place, which we were living together, or we've been living together for eight years. And we never, or at least me, I never wanted to get married. And so he was okay with that. But we did talk about like, you know, being together and having kids and a family and everything. But it was until the past year, he did admit like he just didn't know if he wanted to have kids with me. With you. Yeah, I think that was in February, actually, after his like hospitalization and stuff. Oh, that must have hurt. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess we went through all that, like the whole hospitalization thing for him or his depression. And then like, I was obviously the one there. I was obviously the one that took him and the one there for him. So then once he came out and said those things, like accusatory things to me of like, I basically haven't done enough. That was hard. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've been with him with all the hard stuff, like his mom passed in 2016. So we've been through a lot, even though I had felt maybe the loss of like attraction to him. I haven't lost like the love. Yeah. And that's what I feel like very conflicted about. Yeah. But you know, what is hard is that he's not loving you well. Right. It's like we both feel that way thinking about each other, right? Like we aren't getting what we need from each other. It sounds like you do love him well. And he is not in a place where he receives it well. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) From everything that I know from um, like of his upbringing and stuff, I know like we both have, you know, our childhood trauma that we're sure, we're still yeah. trying to work through. 12 years is a really long time. How long have you known in those 12 years, though? I need a little bit more from this relationship. I guess I started feeling that maybe like more like two or three years ago. Two or three years ago. If you knew it or there was something whispering in your ear, tell me why it was that you didn't step into it at least before signing the lease. Yeah, exactly. Like I wanted to, we just became so codependent that I, and me with him with like making big decisions. Totally. I'm right there with you. Yep. Every time we had the break of conversation, which started last year, and then with the whole lease thing, like even though inside I knew that maybe it's best to just like end it now, I had somewhat like of hope and, you know, he would agree, like we would work on it. So when it came to renewing the lease, I tried to say something. I don't remember if I did, but I had it in my head. I remember like, we already talked about breaking up like two or three times. We should probably do it before we... Tie ourselves up, yeah, financially in each other another year. Right. Yeah. So then I, yeah, didn't say anything. And then... I don't like what he said about the kids and you. I don't know why that kind of lash out is necessary. You know? Right. That's what I felt. And even my friend told me like, yeah, respect yourself and leave. Well, it's indicative of he wanted to sting you right then. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. That's purposeful. And people do that because they're unhappy, you know, and you can't make him happy. Mm-hmm. You know, I want you to have those moments of freedom that comes mm-hmm. from autonomy. I want you to feel those things. I just want you to clock how frequently he makes you feel bad. You know, when he's ungrateful, Mm -hmm. I think if he really loved you and wanted the relationship to be great again, he wouldn't be behaving the way he is. Right. He is the one making this relationship unstable and unworkable. Mm -hmm. And I think that you have to just think hard about that. And sure, you love him, but you can't make him happy. And I really hope that in like four months, five months, maybe you guys have established boundaries that are workable for both of you. Yeah. I think he's going to be needy with you. I think he's going to make you feel guilty. I think he's going to say things maybe like, you're the only person that understands me. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And how could you leave me? Mm -hmm. But I also think it's important to feel empowered in choosing yourself. Yes. It's okay for you to Mm -hmm. choose you. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, the challenge for that is that he's in a vulnerable position 
you too, because you care about him, can be easily manipulated into thinking that choosing you, your financial stability, your emotional stability is selfish. And it is not. Yeah. It is wisdom. It's grace. You know, if you can't help him heal and he's the only person who can do it, you trying to shore up a relationship is not going to make him better. Right. Right. Not for you, not for him. So I am 100% behind what Anna said. And I also want to say, really start to shore up your sense of self for you. Find out how you can maneuver into a more powerful position. Mm -hmm. Hey, we need to find an answer to how to live emotionally safely with each other Mm -hmm. while we transition to the next phase of our relationship. How do we get there? How are we going to do it? I do think that the more you feel empowered and the more you step into your own wisdom about where you need to be and what you need to do for the next 12 years, Mm -hmm. it's going to challenge him a little. Martha, this is part of a journey and there isn't a right or wrong decision. Whatever happens, you'll learn from it. Yeah, I have felt excited for a long time. Good. You know, like moving forward on by myself, having my own stuff. I have the days of feeling guilty, but now I don't know, talking about it. Yeah. God, we beat ourselves up. Don't feel guilty about Mm -hmm. it. You can do it. You're able. I have a feeling about you. I see you can do it. You you feel very strong to me, but just need to put those shoulders back and do it. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah. Martha, I'm thinking about you. Thank you so much. Like, no, truly, I'm like, Memories were flooding through. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure. I know. I feel like a lot of us have been there. We just don't talk about it ever. All of us. I've been there too. They're not awful people. They're wonderful people. Right. You just Mm -hmm. can't make an unhappy person happy and you got to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, just like Karen said, you're strong and good. You're a wonderful person. Thank you. Will you please be in touch, Martha? Yes, I will. Thanks so much, Martha. Bye, Martha. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Karen, you gave beautiful advice. I know I read this somewhere. When you're in the gutter, you're looking up, you can only see the sky, right? Or who said that? I don't know if it was Keith Urban, who I love. Somebody said it. But the thing about being really low is that you can look up and see the sky and there's infinite possibilities in that. And sometimes you don't allow yourself to look and see all of the myriad of abundance and possibility that is around you right? uh, because you're so used to the habit. It's just why I was like, how many years have you known that this needs to turn around and you've been not looking at the infinite possibilities of what is on the other side of deciding, I think I could walk away from this now and find something else. Right. You know, it's a tricky thing for a woman, especially when you care about a man, which you know, and I know you want to take care of people. It feels like a natural nurturing habit. I didn't think I was a nurturing person at all. (laughs) I thought I was just like short and mad. (laughs) (laughs) I know a lot of men who date me because they know inherent to sort of who I am is this desire to nurture, you know, and to take care of and let me fix you some biscuits and some, you know. I think I felt really like taken advantage of in that relationship. And I felt really bad. Like he, he would regularly say, cruel things. Yeah. Really cruel in front of people. Like just, I didn't know why he was so mad at me. Yeah. I've been in that relationship and have to continue to maintain a relationship with someone like that. And we only communicate by email, but the emails are vicious. And the challenge with that is uh, again, boundary, you know, but the hard part for Martha, is it's hard to have boundaries when you see someone every day and they're around you every day. It's just 100%. You know, if it isn't toxic or isn't difficult, it's going to get more and more toxic and the conflict is going to keep rising until they just have to. Jasmine, thank you so much for your letter. You're here with the lovely Karen Pittman. Hi, Jasmine. (laughs) Hi. Jasmine, will you tell us what's going on? 
Yeah. So I, (laughs) I wrote in, in the heat of my heartbreak, honestly, is what it is. I've been with my boyfriend for four and a half years. We actually do live together. I have two kids from a previous relationship marriage, actually. And honestly, my ex relationship was one that I had set up a lot of walls for. Um, There was a lot of gaslighting. There was a lot of lying. There was a lot of deceit. So I have a lot of trauma left over from that. So when I entered this relationship, it was one that I did very cautiously. And I spoke about openly what my past traumas were and what a lot of my triggers are. Wow, Jasmine, you have all the language. You definitely have done some work on yourself. I'm constantly working on myself. And it's really important to me. It's actually the deal breaker for me, uh, making sure that that boundary is respected in my life. And so two things came out of this. The last four years, I was under the assumption that one day we would get married. Between all the different social medias, when I was on Facebook or when I was on Instagram, he would send me cute little posts and pictures of other people's engagements or other people's wedding photos. And it's so cute. Like, that's the perfect spot for like a wedding. Isn't that cute? Or like perfect, like proposal spot. He is the most romantic person on the planet. Like, I I cannot tell you enough how amazing this man is and what he has been for myself and my children. They love him. They call him dad naturally on their own, never forced. And even the last two years of the pandemic, I honestly thought he would have proposed. And my assumption, and that's my my fault, right? My assumption is that he didn't do it because he wanted his parents involved. And with the pandemic happening, he couldn't do that. And that's something his brother did. His parents were also super involved in his proposal. And it was a big family event. He's a super big family guy. His parents have been married for over 30 plus years. So relatively, he has had not a lot of trauma revolving around marriages or broken families. Like he is such a tight knit family guy. I, on the other hand, come from a very broken home, divorced parents, divorce, say myself, and then I'm not really close with my siblings. And so again, under the assumption that one day we would get married because we've had these open conversations of like one day or this looks good, or I would rather do a small wedding. I would never spend this much money or something simple. We've even talked about rings. He doesn't like something too big, something basic. Like we've talked about everything. Wow. And during the pandemic, we joked around like, Hey, it's 2021 girls can propose too. And then we come to a few weeks ago, I actually spoke with his sister and I said, hey, I'm going to surprise him and take him to Disneyland. We took him to his first Disneyland trip just before the pandemic hit. And that was so exciting. And he thought it was so cool that there's a hotel on property that you can walk in, uh, the Grand Californian, I think. And so I said, I want to do that for him because he has been popping up a lot of the Disney proposals and a lot of the Disney like weddings there. And I said, he keeps saying girls can do it too. So you know what? I'll do it. I have no problem doing that. I've already been there, done that. So why can't I do this for him? We've been talking about it. And then he he even joked about it. He's like, okay, well, if you do it, then it has to be this, this, and that. He played along. And so I brought it up again saying, hey, like, so if I do this, you can't say no. And the only way you can say no is if you turn around and propose yourself, right? Because we've talked about this for way too long. And I think he realized that I was taking it more and more seriously. And then just two, three weeks ago, he's like, hey, like, I know you keep bringing this up, but you're not allowed to propose. Like, that's not okay. Like, it shouldn't be you. But honestly, I don't believe in marriage. And then he drops this. He's like, like, I know we've talked about it, but like, I honestly don't believe in marriage. Like, I've never believed in it. You can talk to my brother. I've never believed in it. I don't see like, what's the point? Like, what's the big deal of having a piece of paper? can talk to my brother. His brother and I grew up. uh, He and I are actually friends. It's how we met at his brother's wedding. That's where we reconnected. I've actually known his family my entire life. And so that's why I felt very comfortable going into the relationship because I knew him and his family. Otherwise, I was on dating apps and I would just swipe left and right. I was having fun, but never introduced anybody to my kids. Kept that side of my life super private. I never intended to find a relationship because I figured not now. And then he pursued me and he waited for me, actually. So this was like a bombshell. What happened after he told you? Um, I didn't talk to him for four days. <laughs> I shut down and he's like, hey, so like, what's going on? What do we need to do to fix this? And 
He said, I don't know. I was very just like stoic. And I just kind of just sat there and listened. And he kind of broke things down. My understanding is his previous relationship before mine, he and I were both in six year long relationships and we were both single for about him for about two years, me for about a year and a half before we actually started dating. And I always knew that him and his ex-girlfriend had broken off because she cheated on him on two separate occasions and broke up because of that two times. And what I didn't know, and this is what he came and told me and what I've kind of pieced together is that I don't know if his issue with marriage comes from this or from before then, but I guess he had a friend that he had spoken to about that situation. And before they got back together, his friend had advised him saying, that doesn't sound like a healthy thing for you to do. You probably shouldn't do this. I think she's just doing something to be comfortable and it's not going to have a good ending. And he hasn't talked to that friend since because she was right. And I think he felt embarrassed and ashamed that she was right. And he didn't heed her advice. So he's 29. I wonder if he's trying to work things out in his head. Like he's trying to buy time before fully committing. Because otherwise, it seems like you have a a strong relationship. I mean, it's not wrong in the sense that I get it. I, I think he's definitely grown up fast. Because of my situation, which he knew I had kids, he knew that it meant this isn't going to be a joke relationship. This isn't something to just have fun with. We knew it would be something serious. I think to me, it's not the issue that if he's ready or not, it's that he lied to me or unintentionally lied to me, led me on about something that is... yeah fundamental to his belief system. It's a trust thing. So you feel like kind of took advantage of you in a way. To me, what it seems like is that he's afraid to display a public announcement of, hey, this and that. The other thing that I've come to realize, and I'm not really on social media anymore. I am in school full time and he does support me a lot during this process. Something his family has noticed is that he's always here at home helping me with the kids and they feel that he's not as hands-on with their family. And I do remember one time back in like November, December, he came home and he was really upset. And I said, what's wrong? He's like, I just don't argue with my mom. I said, about what? And he refused to open up. And then same thing after that four day of no talking, he brought up, remember that argument I had with my mom? said, yeah, because that never happens. You're so close. She had mentioned that she thought that I was unhappy because I'm not hanging out with them anymore. And she always sees me stuck at home. But I told her, I love supporting you. I love you chasing your dreams. And I love hanging out with the kids. He would rather do that all day, every day than to be hanging out with dumb boys doing dumb things. But his mom made a side remark saying, well, I just don't know what happened between you and your ex-girlfriend. I really thought you guys were going to get married one day. And so to me, I'm just like, okay, so your parents still don't understand that. And something he also came out to is that he never told his family why they broke up. I don't like it that he told you that. And so that's my thing, right? Like he told me that and he tells me he doesn't believe in marriage. And part of me is just like, well, at this point then, I kind of don't want to put in any effort in getting our families to hang out and getting our families to get to know each other because why would it matter? Well, is it possible, Jasmine, that he has come to this realization as you have started to ready your relationship for a much more defined long-term proposal, for lack of a better word, (laughs) as you have developed your own feeling about, okay, let's just start to talk about permanency. Is it possible that he's like, oh yeah, okay, let me actually think about what this, no, 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 maybe I'm, I don't know if this could work. So I'm not, is it possible that he actually wasn't leading you on, but the fantasy of it being pulled away, now he looks at it in real terms and it's like, I don't know if I actually believe in this thing that the woman that I love is so committed to yet. Like, I don't know if I'm there yet. So I think for me, it can come off as one of like three things. One is definitely that. Yeah. I don't know if he thinks that I'm not as committed. I don't know if he thinks that I can just walk away because he did mention it. He's like, anyone can cheat. Doesn't matter if you're married, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you're wearing a ring. Things can still happen. I think his mistrust in whatever your title is, can go away in the blink of an eye because that's what happened to him. It's also what happened in my relationship. Yeah. And then the other part being, and this is the one thing I talked about with my therapist and she's like, you need to stop taking this off of you. And I'm like, it's hard, but it does make me feel super rejected. And it makes me feel that 
maybe he did believe in marriage at one point and somewhere along the way he just thinks yeah but not with her like maybe <sighs> I, I don't know did I do something that made him change his mind no I don't think you did I, I do think the reality of committing to someone permanently in a marriage is a daunting task I'm going to take this on for the rest of my life and I think what marriage is defined as for you and your love, your boyfriend, has to be something specific to the two of you. But you can have conversations about what that looks like, but not in like a heightened emotional state. Like someone has to let all the air out of the balloon and say, okay, let's just pull away all the anxiety and decide that we're just going to talk about what it looks like to be in a permanent relationship with each other for the rest of our lives. What do you want? How do you want to live? Do you know what I mean? Like that conversation? Does that make sense, Anna? Yes, it does. Because he did betray your trust and it is a little bit mysterious and he may not know how to articulate anything right now. So, you know, of course we would say, well, let's like talk to him about what marriage means to you and commitment and you know the trust and you need like what what well, all that other stuff can happen but he may not know how to reciprocate in any way and he may not be able to hear it yet yeah <laughs> this feels like a situation that calls for time yeah it sounds like you both really love each other and are really invested but it sounds too abrupt for both of your emotional well-being <laughs> especially when it doesn't have to be it's too heartbreaking it's too raw it's been so hard for me. That's what I told my therapist. I said, all of this was so much and it was so heavy that this was a wall that I had before where I accepted that after my divorce, that I'm not going to be that girl. I'm not going to be the girl that get that wedding. I'm not going to be the girl that gets that proposal because I missed my shot. I really thought that that was done and over with. And then I met him and he made me believe that I could be that girl. And so I let that wall come down because he is so, so romantic. And now what I'm really struggling with is how do I separate the idea that he can be romantic and not want this part of life, which I understand marriage is a social construct. If he doesn't believe in it, I can respect that. But I think I would have had a easier time accepting this if I knew about it at the beginning. Of course. I think that you witnessed four years of truth. Absolutely. He's with your kids. Like he loves you. I think Something that it's like a minor tragedy in our culture is how we have been nurtured to romanticize weddings, the bride, our identity within society as a married woman. Your partner is right in the sense of like, I, I understand because I'm a cynic too. I'm a romantic <laughs> But man, I can be pretty cynical. It's just been so expensive. <laughs> but I do think we put so much weight on becoming that identity. I know it's a glorious day, you know, whatever. Everybody, you're surrounded by people you love. You feel beautiful. You're stressed and you're going out of your mind, whatever, all that shit. But it doesn't really shift much. I do believe you guys can have a beautiful relationship without the legal document. I do understand if my partner said that he didn't know if he wanted to marry me, that would feel like a fucking gut punch yeah. and a rejection for sure. And even if it was about society or whatever, it would, of course, feel fucking painful. I think that you're putting pressure on yourself to make a decision because this is raw and it's new. I just think you have to kind of stabilize for a second. At this point, I like don't even want to watch like a romance movie, a romance yeah. TV show. One of my favorite songs and one of my favorite movies is Up. Oh, And the main title track by Michael Giacchini is called Married Life. And that's been on my cover, like on my playlist. And I like had to unlike it because I can't listen to it right now. Like, yeah. Oh, I know what that feels like. But I also think if you make a big decision right now, you might regret it. It does sound like he's still figuring things out and oh, he has some voices in his ear that might not be helping. It's just hard because I can tell what he wants to do is just move forward. He wants to be with you. He's not like seeing other people. Mm -mm, no, no, we're still like this relationship. Slowly, I'm just not letting him in in this one area of my life right now. And I don't want to until we get to our, our couples counseling session. 
That is so valid. I want to agree with you, Anna, that it's valid. But I also have been married and I also have two children. And I know what it's like, maybe you know this too, Anna, to look into the face of your child and know that you've created some pain for them. And you cannot believe that that shit didn't work out like you thought it was going to work out. And it's very hard to forgive yourself for having failed in that way. And I totally, totally get it. That wall going right back. Like, I cannot fucking make that mistake again, dude. Like, how fucking dare you, dude? Do you know what I mean? And also, how dare me, Jasmine? Like, I can't believe this. But the truth of the matter, Jasmine, is that there is great love in the world for you. And it might be in this partner that you are proposing to have in your life. And there's something about the evolution into a loving presence, not just for your partner, for your children, but for yourself that requires vulnerability. It requires that you stay open to love and to what that looks like and defining it, but then redefining it. And then redefining that, that kind of malleability is what love and partnership and marriage is all about. And looking back on the two relationships that I've had in my life that resemble in some form or fashion what you've gone through. My sense is that, you know, again, the ability to guide yourself is in you. It's not in your partner, right? You're the person that's going to, you know, figure it out for the both of you and your strength and your clarity is going to create the life and the love that you want and that you need, right? I don't necessarily believe that that is outside of you, that a marriage or a proposal or this thing is going to actually create the reality that you want. You create it, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I came strong with that, Anna. Did you feel yeah, that I energy loved it. coming I through the Zoom? Because I've been, I've been listening to you and I see you talk about your love. And I see you talk about the feeling and then the walls go up. And then I hear you talking about them and then the walls go back up. And it's in your voice, it's in your eyes, it's in your face. And maybe love looks like something else. And thank God for this man, because he's helping you redefine it now. In these four years, he's loved you and your children so well. Do you know? And the plan that you had for how this is going to look, oh, now I have to shift my plan. (sighs) Oh, God, really? Okay. Can you stay open to what all that means, Jasmine, is my question for you. And how do you answer that? Does it take three weeks? Does it take three months? Do you know? Does it take a lifetime? Do you know what I mean? That was what I walked away with my session today. I said, you know, ultimately, I think the biggest question is, what's it going to take for me to be happy? Mm. Um, And I think definitely time, because I can't force him to change his mind. That's not my goal, because at this point, If I were to say, I need him to marry me to be happy, that's not the honest truth. Because at this point, I don't even want that. I don't Mm. even want him to consider changing his mind or proposing on the off chance that he's only doing it to appease me because that's exactly what my ex-husband would do. He'd do whatever it would take to make me happy for the now, but then three weeks later, go back into old habits and still be true to who he was. And not to the person that I needed in my life. Yep. Yep. We know this and- relationship. We were talking about it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and so- Unfortunately, I was in, I was in fact married to this guy that you used to be married to. <laughs> 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 yes. I know this guy. He's wearing a different pair of pants, mm-hmm. but he has been in my life as well. So we've only had three times where maybe we got into like, like they're not even arguments like yeah he's been so good he he puts in the effort so if he loves you well and he makes you feel good that is worth so much that's worth anything it really is it's in what he's doing it's in the say do ratio as my mother would say hey we're team whoever this guy is yeah like we're for him (laughs) i know we are you describe this man with so much love and affection and i think karen is right and i would let him love you again i would work on that let yourself be loved jasmine yeah girl you deserve it after all this these children they take it out of you (laughs) this world you're in school my feeling is you're a mom you're in school you're working you gotta make it's just one fucking day that's really expensive (laughs) 
It's <laughs> that too. But you deserve this good love. You deserve yeah. it. You're smiling as you think about this option. <laughs> it just doesn't have to be surgical at this point. It can continue to be something that really is a fulfilling, beautiful part of your life. I could not agree more. There's a lot of science and love, and but there's also a lot of art. There's just, you know, creativity. And don't forget to tap into all of that. It sounds like a beautiful human being who loves you. And Jasmine, by the way, I grew up in like a picture perfect family as well. My parents have been married for like fucking 138 years. <laughs> and they it's were the long first time. people that they like, they lost their virginity to each other, or so they say, I don't know. <laughs> and both my brother and I have been married three times. <laughs> yeah. We're both on our third marriage. And we talk about this like, what, what happened? Like, we were supposed to be. We had the perfect example. Yeah, we had the perfect example. And I actually think. Having that made my brother and I think it was either easy or mm. that we should get married early or I don't know. I guess we still need to unpack that, but for whatever it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a storybook. I mean, I think so many of us come into it, love and yeah. especially marriage. Like marriage is a storybook. It looks like this and then the that and then the proposal and then the thing. And then you live happily ever after. And actually that long-term relationship shit is a lot different. It's a lot different. Yeah. How you define it and create it in your life is your own personal innovation with the human being that you love. Mm -hmm. And um, that is what makes it magical and powerful and life-changing. What you create, what you innovate, not how you fall into the storybook, you know, the thing that everybody says it's supposed to be. It's what you say. It's the template you create. And your children create from there, right? Are you going to go to Disneyland? Uh, yeah, so that is still planned. Good. You better go and have a good time. You better go and have a good yeah, time. Yeah, have a great time. Have a great time. We spent two years locked up. And those two years made us like chew on all of this stuff, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I've found, I've talked about this before, that our callers after like sort of the vaccination rollout and people started to come out of the thing, everyone was putting pressure on themselves to make big life decisions. Mm. Like, should we get married? Or should I move out? Should I change my job? Or should, should we I... get divorced? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. So give us some time, make sure it's not a post-pandemic fallout. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> like... it's, there's so much to save. There's so much of value here. Yeah, I would say go to Disney World and have the best time, the time of your life. Make it into the thing that you didn't imagine that it was going to be. I mean, just be so creative. You've got it in you. You're a mom. I believe that, yeah. you know, we are the most creative humans on the world. It can't not be fun. It's the happiest place on earth. It's the happiest place on earth. And you make it the happiest place on earth for your family. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you so much, Karen. Did we help? Honestly, yes, because I like I haven't had anyone to really talk about this too. And when I talked to my therapist, like we just focused on the me aspect, which is totally appropriate. But I think trying to be able to understand a little bit more on his and being pro, you know, him, right? Because I'm not against him. I'm just... No, you love him. You're heartbroken. <laughs> I'm just a little heartbroken. So I think I just needed that extra set of ears and eyes to tell me it's not wrong to keep loving him. This not isn't a deal all. breaker. It's just a painful time. And I just, I need this time to, to be in my feeling for a little bit. I, I need this time. Jasmine, thank you so much. I'm thinking about you. Please be in touch. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye, Jasmine. Bye, Jasmine. Bye, Anna. Bye, Bye. Karen. Bye. Karen, you gave such beautiful advice. She's amazing. I know. She's amazing. I think, I mean, I would have said this to her, but that she has brought this incredible love into her life. I think she's manifested this incredible human into her life. And uh, he's giving her one of the biggest lessons that she could possibly learn, which is self-acceptance, forgiving the strength and power and just letting somebody love you. Do you know? Yeah. And she has created that lesson in her life. And I'm just so impressed. Like I'm dying to kind of have somebody come into my life that loves me so well, but won't fit into the box that I've created for him to fit into. <laughs> you mentioned that earlier about your father. Yeah. You're afraid that people don't live up. Yeah. 
I do. I mean, I think that that's part of the great fear that I have of letting myself go and fall in love with someone is that you're going to have to shift and change and become more and more vulnerable to the experience of love. And it's just, you know, you got to be ready for that in a lot of ways. And I think the amount of time it's going to take is not in the full definition of letting him be who he is or coming to the understanding that it's okay to get married. It's her allowing him to love her like she is. Like, just let yourself be loved. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm actually talking to myself now, Hannah. Yeah. Oh, man. It's the best advice in the world, though. Let yourself be loved. But it's so hard. It's so hard, especially if you've been hurt. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. You know, the walls that we walk into over and over again because people say they're going to do what they're going to do and then they don't do it. Karen, before I let you go, um, do you have advice for um, raising a teenage boy? Yes. I mean, one of the good pieces of advice that I got was my son's teenage years were really a challenge for me. And I think that the years were difficult because when I was my son's age, 11, 12, 13, was when my parents sort of emotionally let go. And I felt at sea, like I felt like I was by myself a little bit. So when my son got to that age, I did not have the tools, the resources to sort of stay latched onto him. I just kind of was letting him go until a therapist said to me, you know, you're letting him go, but it may be that he needs you even more, you know, at this age, right? So I remember, you know, very specifically deciding he's going to push hard on me to step back. And, you know, because obviously you're becoming a young man, you need to delineate from your mother and from your parents in general. But I'm going to make sure that he knows I'm still here for him. And it really, first of all, shifted me into being a much better mother for my daughter, who has had a much more difficult experience of puberty because she went through it in the pandemic where she didn't have her friends around her. But also it made our relationship stronger because he knew I could withstand the difficulty. Like a challenge came up, mom is still going to be right there for me. You know, I can still talk through anything with mom. And I think he feels like that to this day, you know? I love that. That's wonderful. So stick around, Mm -hmm. be available. Don't back off just because he says, I mean, you know, respect boundaries, but I like that. That's really good advice (laughs) because I could totally see myself being like, oh, yeah, okay, we're going to be gone for like two weeks. So just take care of the house. (laughs) (laughs) Or, or, you know, constantly, you know, tween age boys, you know, take a shower, dude, take a shower. shower. Dude, let me show you how to wash your own clothes because I cannot wash your stinky clothes. I know. I have a wonderful stepson who is, he's 15. I have two stepchildren. Oh, wow. What a gift. Yes, but it took me a long time. That's another journey. I think I was immature. Uh I only have an older brother. Yeah. I had the selfishness of a typical youngest sibling. Youngest child. Yeah, 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 yeah. I totally get that. Me too. Me too. I, I, But I am so grateful to my daughter's stepmother. She is the most fantastic cheerleader. That's great. I think a lot of people would feel like, oh, you don't have... I have not a jealous bone in my body when it comes to my daughter. If people love her, I think, oh my gosh, she deserves all the love in the world. What an incredible human. Yeah, love her. Yes, she deserves it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that her stepmother finds great joy in, you know, hanging out with her. They go get manicures and pedicures together. She doesn't go get a mani-pedi with me anymore because she goes to get it with her with her stepmother. And I'm like, you better get that. You better not. (laughs) Karen, I have just loved talking with you. I cannot thank you enough. This has been so much fun. Like, Good. I think I should do this again. I would love that. Anytime. <laughs> you are amazing. I really, really love and appreciate you. And thank you so much for all of this time. Well, can I say this to you before we go? I think that you're, you've got this incredible, playful spirit. And I think it is such a joy to meet you because I think it's possible to have depth and be playful at the same time. And I see that so clearly in your connection to people. And I see it very clearly in your acting now that we're talking about it, but what a joy to be around you and to experience your connection with your audience. And 
and just to chat with you. I'm so grateful for this experience to share some time with you and hear your thoughts and share mine. I can't thank you enough.